Hello and welcome to your DNR confirmation form, Deceased Patient Standards Pre-Course Review. My name is Dwayne Cattell, I'm one of the Regional Paramedic Educators for the Base Hospital Program. So we're going to be talking about the DNR confirmation form first of all. Um, we see this regularly on most of our calls. Um, and uh, so let's talk about the basics of the DNR form, who it can be signed by. So it can be signed, uh, the signatory uh, for the delegation of this can be by a physician, by a registered nurse, a uh, registered nurse with an extended care type of classifications, um, and uh, RPNs, registered practical nurses. So what this does, when this is signed off and everything is complete, um, it it verifies that there is and confirms that there is an existing plan in place uh, that's going to exclude doing any type of resuscitative efforts for the patient. So what does this DNR confirmation form do for us as paramedics working in the trucks? It provides us with clear directions uh, with respect um, to what patient care intervention, patient care interventions may be initiated. It lists what procedures we can and cannot perform. Um, however, it's the signatory is responsible for the existence of the form. So the, the doc, the nurse, the RPN, or the nurse with extended class uh, type of care. and um, we're not really actually required to review the form um, or confirm the actual DNR on the patient's health care record. Um, it's the signatory that's responsible for that. However, we need to just make sure that there are certain things filled out on the form so it is confirmed and valid and we can honor it. So the DNR confirmation form has a few interesting features that make it simpler for the families, the, the physicians, the nurses involved, and the paramedics and the patient themselves. It makes it easier to use. Uh, first of all, it's a, it's a single page and it is bilingual and it is noted that English is on one side of the form and French is on the other side of the form. In addition, it also has a unique seven-digit serial number which is individualized for that particular patient. No two patients have the same number. Um, having this number uh, helps to validate the authenticity of the form. Uh, if there is no serial number on the form or it's, it, you cannot read it because it's faded or ripped or torn, what have you, that means it's not valid and we are not to honor that DNR confirmation form if the serial number is absent or it's unreadable. Therefore, because of the aforementioned uh, unique features, it's considered a durable document. Um, because of this, uh, there is no reason to, we don't have to sign the form, new copies don't have to be made for every single patient contact. Um, as well, once the form is completed and signed uh, by the patient's healthcare provider, uh, photocopies can be made. Um, we don't have to search for the original as long as the photocopy is there and everything, the serial number is legible and everything is filled out appropriately. Uh, we can honor that, which in turn helps keep the original uh, safe in their patient care record. So by implication, the DNR confirmation form really has no expiry date. Uh, the expiry date would coincide with the patient's death. Um, changes to the DNR confirmation form can be made by the patient themselves or the substitute decision maker, as well as the DNR can be rescinded, totally don't want it anymore, and that can be done by the patient uh, or the substitute decision maker. And uh, just note that it's always good to confirm that this is the patient's DNR just in case it has been rescinded and that may not be reflective in their patient care chart where you're picking them up at. So when the, we're determining the validity of the uh, DNR confirmation form when we're on scene with a patient, um, we have to confirm the validity. So. Uh, making sure that all the mandatory sections are filled out. There's a signature on there. Um, if you come across a form that's incomplete, it's not filled out, no signature, um, you know, you can't read the serial number in the top right hand corner, that means it is not valid and in such a case, resuscitate the patient. 
And in front of you here, this is a sample of the DNR confirmation form, which uh, we'll see out in the field. So once again, um, the DNR confirmation form has a unique seven digit serial number in the top right hand corner. If the serial number is not there or it's uh, unreadable, uh, it cannot be considered valid. So moving down the form, uh, this next section of the DNR confirmation form, uh, it contains the statement uh, which describes the purpose of the form, uh, which enables us to, as medics, to honor this uh, DNR confirmation form. Uh, the patient's name is recorded here, the first name and last name. Um, and this, the statement in this section also sets forth the patient care interventions that, that can and cannot be done uh, when the form is completed and signed uh, by the designated healthcare professional. So the next section of this uh, DNR confirmation form, point one, is located directly below the patient's name and actually includes a definition of what do not resuscitate means. In addition, it also provides specific examples of what we can and what we cannot do uh, when presented with this, uh, with this form for the patient. So our next uh, section on the uh, DNR confirmation form uh, is the signatory area for the healthcare provider. Um, and the healthcare provider has to ensure that they've exercised um, due diligence by confirming that the, all the information is correct for signing the form. We as paramedics are not expected to investigate the condition or the reason why the DNR confirmation form is made or ordered for this patient. Uh, nor are we required to review or confirm where the actual DNR is in their patient's health care record. That is not our requirement. So within that same section, um, there's two tick boxes. And the first tick box um, basically is the plan that they're not, the, the patient when capable of doing so or substitute decision maker has decided that you know what they don't want to be resuscitated or the patient has decided I don't want to be resuscitated so no CPR and uh, no cardiopulmonary resuscitative efforts will take place. So the second tick box in the same section uh, would be checked off by the physician and it would indicate that in his or her opinion, in conjunction with the power of return, or sorry, the substitute decision maker or the patient themselves feel that, you know what, resuscitative efforts would be futile in this case. Now, a nurse uh, can check this box and sign the form if they know that this was the condition under which the patient's treatment plan um, was developed. Uh, it, it is the responsibility of the healthcare provider who has signed the form to ensure that the documentation in the patient's health record supports and is indicated all the requirements for no resuscitative efforts. So this next section is where the uh, signatory actually signs the DNR confirmation form. Uh, they check the appropriate uh, tick box which would indic indicate their credentialing or their professional designation. Uh, they print their name, their first and last name, in the areas indicated, as well as their signature and the date of the form. So what do we do with this when we're on scene? So you get called to uh, uh, cardiac arrest or, or determine that the patient is in cardiac arrest. Um, and when the medics become, or we become a, aware of the existence of DNR confirmation form, we try to obtain that. Okay, um, you get that from the patient or from the family members, the RN, uh, whoever's present. Um, now, the presence of the person who signed the form is not dependent for the validity. Once it's signed, it's signed. Um, always want to review to make sure we can see that unique seven digit serial number and ensure all the other areas are filled out. Uh, confirming like th this is the actual patient that you're dealing with. Um, we don't have to go to great lengths in order to find that, uh, but we try to validate the form as best we can.
So when you're on scene, if you deem that the form is not valid for any reason, i.e. the serial number is unreadable or is not present, if, there's, if the form is not signed by the healthcare professional, then resuscitate the patient. That is the directive. Um, we always, and like I said before, we always try to ensure the validity of the form by confirming it. Yes, this is the patient that is on the form, and this is the patient who's in cardiac arrest. We want to make sure it's the same, the correct form for the correct patient. Um, it is preferable to have confirming uh, documentation to identify the patient. Uh, however, it may not be practical or feasible uh, in all instances to obtain this information. So moving on to the deceased patient standards review, um, what is it here for? So well, the first thing, it's meant to replace the basic life support patient care standards patients with VSA transportation standard. It was developed uh, uh, in conjunction with the office of the chief coroner. It ensures a standard and a, a, that a standard is maintained and there's some consistency within that standard. It addresses the best practices for dealing with death in the field. It also looks at expect it addresses rather expected and unexpected death, and it was designed uh, by the deceased in home working group, uh, and they did trial solutions uh, for these particular situations. So, looking at the deceased patient standards uh, document, uh, doing a quick review here, uh, it addresses three different. Uh, types of situations. The first one is you're on scene, you've worked your VSA, uh, you're in a, in a house, uh, the, you've called the base hospital physician and a tour has, medical tour has been granted, termination or resuscitation order has been granted, and the patient is basically left on scene. Uh, the second situation is where uh, you get arrived to a VSA and you're either in a public place or family is not coping well, so you decide to move the patient to the back of the ambulance you go through your resuscitative efforts and you call for a medical termination of resuscitation and it's granted by the base hospital physician and that's while you're still in the ambulance in the driveway in park the wheels haven't started to move on the ambulance yet the third situation is where you're called and you arrive at a VSA and it's either in a public place or the family's not coping well and so you decide to move the patient to the to your ambulance so you're in the back of the ambulance and you get to the point where they meet all the criteria to call the base hospital physician for a termination of resuscitation order and then you st your, your partner starts driving the truck while you're getting the termination of resuscitation order on route so your wheels are moving that way your truck is will not be out of, ser out of service and it's not the scene of death you would take it to the appropriate emergency department and they will help you with uh, disposition of the patient. So if you have any questions regarding um, the, any of the medical directives at all, uh, please feel free to contact one of the regional paramedic educators listed on your screen. Thank you.